right. The role of surgery in the treatment of heart disease. I have to hold this. First of all, if I seem slightly disoriented, it's because I've been operating for the last 24 hours straight. <laughs> Had a, I, I'm on call and I had a couple of uh, trauma operations in the middle of the night. So I'm slightly sleep deprived. But some people tell me that my lectures are better <laughs> when I'm a little sleep deprived. Uh, so just uh, so I can understand who I'm talking to, uh, how many people here uh, have seen me talk before? A lot of you. Uh-oh. Um, okay, so that, that looked like over half, probably. Um, how many people here have Parkinson's disease? That, that looks like more than half, which is odd, because usually it's about half. You know, because usually if you have Parkinson's disease, you have a buddy. Uh, Okay, well, that's, that's terrific. Thanks, everybody, for, for coming to the symposium again this year. And, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak. Uh, uh, the topic that uh, I'm talking about, the role of surgery in the treatment of Parkinson's disease, uh, for a lot of you, you will have given, you will have heard me in person. I can see some faces in the room that I've sat down with for an hour and talk about this very topic, right? And so a lot of you uh, will will know this material, but I actually think it's important that I, and uh, even for people who aren't having surgery, I think it's really good to understand what the role of surgery is in the treatment of Parkinson's disease. So, um, I, I have no conflicts of interest with regard to the information I'm sharing with you today. And I'm grateful to all of the people who provide funding for all of the research that we do at the University of Florida Center for Movement Disorders and Neuro Restoration. Uh, I'm not going to talk about any non-FDA approved applicant. Well, I might. But I don't intend to, but every once in a while I do anyway. Uh, this is our team, and a lot of you will know uh, many of the people on this team. I always put this slide in every talk up at the beginning because, you know, we have an amazing team. And uh, we, for two years now, we've moved into this really just ridiculously beautiful facility uh, where we all work side by side and you go and you meet with all the different types of Parkinson's experts that are, that are on our team. Um, but. Uh, when we are asked to give talks about the center, which uh, we are, because it's actually a very unique thing we've been able to do. Uh, we now have a steady stream of visitors from other institutions around the world to come and see what, how did you manage to do this and, and how's it working out. Um, anyway, the, the point is the facility is beautiful, but what makes this center special is, is the people. Uh, and they're all sort of committed and like-minded, and we all sort of have the same mission. Uh, some of you have seen this.
living supercomputer. Um, and you know, I think it's it's interesting to think about the fact that the human brain is the most complex and powerful thing in, in the known universe. There's nothing more complex, nothing more powerful uh, and mysterious. And for those of us, well, you, you, you've met a lot of the people here today um, who sort of devote our lives to figuring this out, uh, we realize, you know, we never will completely, but we're making amazing progress. And, and it's progress that people are noticing. I'm going to show you some some progress we're making. Um, and, you know, the President of the United States a couple weeks ago uh, said we should invest $100 million, which, by the way, is not very much in the NIH. Um, we should invest $100 million in brain mapping. Um, and I can tell you that that's not enough, uh, but it's an investment that now people are realizing that we need to make. And it's the time to make it because we have all sorts of tools now to study the human brain that we haven't had in the past and we're learning at an exponential rate. Uh, and it, the things we're learning about how the brain works are, are translating into better treatments for people who have brain disorders. So it's, it's a boon right now. Uh, I think we should make an investment. And then you know, I can't tell, tell you how many people have come up to, to me over the last couple of weeks and said, hey, $100 million for brain mapping, isn't that what you and Michael Oaken do? And I said, well, yes, it is. And they well, where are you going to get any of that money? Well, I, I assume that most of it's going to come directly to us, isn't it, Michael? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to skip ahead and let's, let's talk about Parkinson's disease. Obviously, that's, that's why we are convened today. Turn on the sound for that video, um, and this is a sophisticated, sophisticated crowd. Most of you have seen this explanation before. I'm just going to say, um, neurosurgeons like to simplify things. We're the opposite of neurologists. Neurologists like to complicate everything. <laughs> we like to make things as simple and straightforward as possible. We're simple people. Cut here. Um, but uh, this is the lecture that we give to the medical students. Here's how you remember the four cardinal motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is a trap that makes it so you can't move the way you want to move. And the trap is a mnemonic for tremor, rigidity, or stiffness. Akinesia, which, is, which means no movement in Latin. Uh, bradykinesia is actually more accurate, right? That means slow movement. Um, of course, triple is not nearly as good of a mnemonic. So we use akinesia and, and um, postural instability. So um, now you know as much as most of the medical students do about Parkinson's disease. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, anybody who's older than me, what I figured out giving lectures and talking to people, if you're older than me, and you, don't, and you don't know about Parkinson's disease. So I'm not talking about this crowd, but you'll know what I mean uh, because you, you've seen it. <laughs> Anybody older than 46 um, thinks Parkinson's disease is this. It's tremor. Oh, you got a tremor? You have Parkinson's disease. Any tremor, that's Parkinson's disease. <laughs> Anybody younger than me, though, interestingly, doesn't think that. They think it's this. <laughs> Because they, what they know of Parkinson's disease is Michael J. Fox. He has had such a profound effect on the public psyche that his dyskinesia problem is so represent, has become representative for younger people of what Parkinson's disease. And I have to explain that that's not Parkinson's disease. That's a side effect of Parkinson medication. Right? That's what happens to a brain that's starved for dopamine when it gets a big flood of it. So we're going to talk about that a little bit, real quick. Uh, and, and some of you know I spent some time training in France with Professor Benedict, who's the guy who started the, the deep brain stimulation. And um, 
this is this is one of the things I've learned. There aren't a lot of French pe French speakers in the audience. I can tell. Usually, one or two people will start laughing. Um, the translation of this slide. This is something I learned in France. It is better to have Parkinson's disease than to have Alzheimer's disease because it is preferable to spill a little of one's beer than to forget to drink it. <laughs> So, uh, I won't dwell on this for a long time. Uh, everyone in this room doesn't need to be told that Parkinson's disease costs uh, individuals and society at large a great deal. Um, I apologize in advance for this. So, and we're living longer, right? Um, so, 
Parkinson's disease is not enough dopamine in the brain, makes it so that motor network doesn't work. So how would you treat it if, if that's, if that's the, the simple version of the problem? Well, now that we know that that's, that's what's missing, we uh, replace it. We take pills, dopamine pills. Uh, what's, what are the dopamine pills called? Cinema and I, yeah, carbidopa, levodopa, right? So the levodopa is, is, the, is the dopamine part. Uh, uh, what's a carbidopa for? Yeah, what, what does cinnamon mean? I know some of you, we've had this discussion, right? Um, it, sin means without, and emet means vomit. So cinnamon just means without vomit. Because before, when they just gave people uh, El Dopa, everybody got better, but they threw up. And so they figured out that if you add carbidopa, it keeps you from throwing up. See, simple neurosurgical way of thinking about it. Um, and here's the circuitry that we're talking about, that motor circuitry. I know all of you have this memorized, so I won't go into the details. Um, and of course, we, we said, um, you give, this is a video that, that you've all seen before, not perhaps this video, but you've seen videos of people uh, who have Parkinson's disease, who have a dramatic response to cinnamon, right? You, you replace the dopamine, and all of a sudden that network, that electrical network in the brain functions, and, you know, things get a lot better. Um, so, when that was discovered, there were a whole bunch of people doing operations to treat Parkinson's disease, brain operations, called pallidotomies, uh, and they were pretty effective. Uh, but when Cinemet was discovered, all surgery for the treatment of Parkinson's disease came to a screeching halt. Of course, right? If you can solve the problem with a pill, why would you have brain surgery? Unless you're crazy. Uh, so, all brain surgery stopped, uh, but obviously something must have happened since then, or I wouldn't be standing here, right? Because I do lots of brain surgery for Parkinson's disease. Probably more than anyone else. Um, so, uh, what, obviously what happens, is pharmacology. Um, the brief pharmacology lecture, you guys have seen this before. Uh, this is uh, the neurosurgeon's two minute lecture on pharmacology 101. I don't know if this works. Yeah. So, if I have a headache and I take an aspirin at time zero, uh, I swallow it, it gets absorbed in my intestine, into my blood. And as time goes forward, the amount of aspirin in my blood increases, and at some magical point, it becomes what we call therapeutic, right? I have enough aspirin, in concentration of aspirin in my blood that my headache feels better. Um, and so it's still being absorbed, and then at some point, all of the aspirin that I took is, is in, as much as it's gonna get in, but but the second that it gets in my blood, uh, my kidneys, whose job it is to get rid of stuff that doesn't belong in my blood, are trying to get rid of it, right? So um, once it's all in, then it gradually goes away. And it, at this later time, for me it's usually about four or five hours, um, if whatever was causing my headache in the first place is still there, my headache comes back, right? And so then I could take another aspirin. If I'm somebody who gets headaches a lot, and I know, oh, when I get one of these kind of headaches, it's going to stay for days. Then, if I were smart, what would I do? I wouldn't wait for my headache to come back, right? I'd say, well, I can predict, based on past experience, that in about four hours, my headache's going to come back. So, at three and a half hours, I'm going to take another aspirin. Uh, and that's how we do it, right? And that's what we do with uh, Parkinson's disease. And when you first get told you have Parkinson's disease, lots of you have lived this. Um, if you're one of the lucky ones who, oh, five minutes, all right, I went way too slow. All right, um, so you, you take your pills and you stay and you keep enough dopamine in your brain so that you keep this dotted line above that line and you try to keep the, the doses low enough so that you don't get up into this side effect business, right? 
hallucinations and dyskinesias, and then you may have all of this stuff when your medicine wears off, right? But in the beginning, when you have Parkinson's disease, it's pretty easy to keep the amount of dopamine in your blood at a reasonable level so that you function pretty well. Some people go for five years and they take three cinnamon tablets a day and they do just fine. But eventually, what happens? This is what happens. Right? So, my brain is producing less and less dopamine, so I have to take more and more by pill to, to get the network to function. So, the amount that I have to take to become therapeutic goes up, and my brain becomes more sensitive to dopamine. It's because it's starved for dopamine, because there's less around, so my tendency to get dyskinesis and hallucinations increases, so the threshold for that comes down. It takes less cinnamon to cause these problems as time goes forward. So that therapeutic window becomes more and more narrow, and it becomes more and more difficult to keep that wavy line of the amount of dopamine in your blood in between there. So what does a movement disorders neurologist do? He's a wavy line brain blur. That's all they do, right? They, they, they manipulate your drugs, and, and it's all about doing sometimes ingenious things, but creative things with your medications to try to make that wavy line, the amount of dopamine in your bloodstream, stay inside the therapeutic window so you can function, so that your motor system works, right? But eventually, that therapeutic window gets more and more and more narrow, and it gets to the point where your neurologist throws up his hands and says, you know, I, I, you know you're, you're a motor fluctuator. Fluctuation means wave, right? So you become one of these people with Parkinson's disease who's had it for five to ten years, and now you, you can't stay in the window, and so you spend your day going back and forth between too much dopamine and not enough dopamine, right? So you have dyskinesias, and then your drugs wear off, and then you're stiff and slow and you can't walk, and then you take your drugs and you wait for them to kick in, and then you have a brief interval where you're actually functioning pretty well, and then you go into your dyskinesias, and you go back and forth. And you can see you're riding that wave. So, um, I said I was going to talk about the role of surgery in the treatment of Parkinson's disease. This is it. Okay? The role is, I can, by directly stimulating that motor circuitry in the brain, that's malfunctioning because it doesn't have enough dopamine, I can smooth out that line, dampen it, you know, you know dampen it means, right? You take a sine wave and you add a straight line to it and it makes the, the peaks shorter and the valleys higher. Um, so, <coughs> deep brains. So, um, devices implanted here. Some of the people in this room have them implanted in the chest. The wires are tunneled under the skin. They go through a dime-sized hole that I drill on the top of your head while you're awake. Uh, it doesn't hurt. Right? <laughs> All right. Um, and we deliver very precisely uh, selected pulses of electricity to that malfunctioning network. We know where we can, in that, that network slide I showed, where we can manipulate it with electricity to sort of bypass the dopamine, right? And this is what happens. So we add DVS to this motor fluctuation. And the wave dampens. And do this. So, now, here's the take-home message. Um, deep brain stimulation does not cure Parkinson's disease. Um, in fact, deep brain stimulation, if you think about this slide, doesn't even really make you any better necessarily than you are when you're at your best now, or before deep brain stimulation. Uh, what deep brain stimulation does is it keeps you in the therapeutic window much more of the time. 
it, and it makes your lows less low. So when your meds do wear off, you're less debilitated by stiffness and slowness and these other problems. And you're, we can uh, very frequently completely block the dyskinesias that people get uh, with their medications. So it improves quality of life. It doesn't cure the problem. In fact, you still have Parkinson's disease, and it's still, unfortunately, a progressive degenerative disorder, but your ability to function increases significantly if you're an appropriately selected candidate. Uh, and, and we've gotten very good, after having done hundreds of these, <laughs> at identifying people who are likely to get a lot of benefit from it. Uh, so we have that whole team of people I showed you, and we're all involved in helping you make that decision, doing that risk-benefit analysis. Because obviously you wouldn't have brain surgery collectively uh, unless you were pretty sure that it was going to improve your quality of life. right? Because we're not going to save your life. This is an elective brain surgery. So you must be crazy if you choose elective brain surgery. Right? Um, or you have Parkinson's disease. Uh, so uh, I, I think I'll stop there. Um, well, I should show at least one video of someone, you've, I'm sure most of you have seen this sort of thing, but I'll show one video, and so this is a sort of a classic case. This is the same man. Uh, this is off medication in both cases, and this is before he had deep brain stimulators implanted. And this is after, and I've sort of edited these videos so that he's doing in one slide, well, he's doing the same thing, or trying to do it on this side. Uh, and some of you can identify with his small, stiff, slow movements, his lack of facial expression, his ongoing tremor. And, you know, he now makes bigger, faster movements, much more effective. Um, you can see his tremor's a lot better, um, you know. Uh, this is this is a great result, but honestly, this is what we expect. Uh, we expect to get a great result when we choose to do brain surgery on somebody. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, if my definition of success and failure is if I call you a year later after we implant, if we make you bionic with the deep brain stimulator, if I call you a year later and say, um, are you better? Are you glad you did it? If you don't say, my life is better, I'm glad I did it, then it's a failure, right? Because that's all we were trying to do. And if you do, if you put someone through brain surgery, even though it's minimally invasive and now very safe, it's still brain surgery and there's still that, you know, one in a hundred chance of something bad happening and, and you could end up worse off after the operation than you are before. So it's a risk uh, that people take. And, they, and we shouldn't take it unless we're pretty sure that we're going to help you. And what I'll say is that at our center, we've now got the numbers at about 1%, you know, you, you end up worse off after the operation. So 99 times out of 100, you don't end up worse off after the operation than you are before. Um, 90 plus percent of the time, people say that they're either very much improved or much improved. So we feel pretty darn good about that. That's better than any other operation I do. Um, which makes this operation really fun to do. Um, and the, the other thing that I've told some of you is, about 50% of the time, there will be something along the way that you don't like. And I think that's a good realistic thing to think about. You know, maybe you have a headache longer than you thought you would, or maybe you have a... a superficial infection, you have to take some antibiotics or something along the way that you don't like. So there's a 50-50 chance that there will be some uh, either minor or significant adverse events. But even the people who have those adverse events, we call them a year later, there's a 90% plus chance that they're going to say, oh yeah, but I'm still so glad I did it. And I'm so glad that I do it, and um, I thank you very much for having me here.